Right, so I think it's probably time um, for us to begin. We won't keep you any longer um, before we get started. So today we've got um, Sarah Powell and Mariana Vigi presenting Imaging for PPEs. It's not black and white. Um, both Sarah and Mariana are an uh, integral part of the teleradiology team um, at Vets UT. Uh, they don't need much of an introduction, uh, have worked in world-recognised clinics um, and have a wealth of experience behind them. So without further ado, let's let Sarah begin. If you've got any questions, please um, do save them till the end of the webinar and pop them in the chat box right at the end. And there'll be plenty of time for question and answer set session with both Sarah and Mariana. Hi. Um, hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I'm going to kick off proceedings with um, half an hour on pre-sale radiographic screening, specifically to the yearling of the yearling thoroughbred with the intended use being racing. Um, I can't really hope to be entirely comprehensive in 30 minutes, but we'll hopefully get through some interesting and some key points to take away. So today I'm going to start with some comments on the published literature and what we can um, take away from that. A brief outline of the UK sales and pre-purchase procedure in the yielding thoroughbreds, some notes on radiographic assessment and interpretation, and then we'll run through some specific pathologies and uh, key points at the end to summarize. Um, just to begin, um, the prevalence of radi radiological abnormalities in yearlings presented for sale at public auction and their impact on the future performance of those horses has been investigated in a small number of, of studies and um, specifically the USA, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa and Japanese studies are of note. There are only a few consistent or strong relationships between the radiologic findings and key measures of performance that include a likelihood to start the time to first start a race and the career placings and the prize money involved. Um, but most of these studies and the, the, the ones that I've used in for today's um, webinar, particularly to um, produce some of the prevalence data, um, most of the studies sample a selected population and they are those yearlings which are being sold at premier sales and they don't take into account previous or subsequent surgical interventions or the number of many less common conditions which are insufficient uh, to draw statistically robust conclusions about uh, the relevance of those things for, um, for future soundness. But from this, this, what's published in the literature, and, and there are many good papers which has made an excellent contribution, we do know something about the prevalence of lesions in repository yearlings. So it's important to say that the data of, of, on prevalence if, is those which present in, repos in repository sets of yearling radiographs. And um, we also have a good idea about which lesions have some significance, but empirical data and personal experience remains extremely valuable. And it is this empirical personal data from um, discussions with vets who are intricately involved in these examinations, from which I've concluded many of the risk assessments in the following slides. But regardless of the general sort of indirectness of the risk associations, the risk may still certainly be attached to some changes which I'll present to you today. And um, because of clinical experience and potential problems arising from similar lesions, you sort of get an impression of which are most uh, likely to cause interruption to lameness or reduce trainability should lameness arise. But as far as assessing risk is concerned, it's best assessed um, using what's sort of referred to as a risk matrix. And this includes the probability of a negative outcome arising from a specific lesion, um, but also the likelihood of, that, of uh, the severity of that negative outcome. So not just whether it will a, a, an issue will arise, but whether or not that will have a severe impact on that particular horse. And it's important to say that the, the published literature, as useful as it is, doesn't necessarily answer the ultimate question posed by purchasers. And that is, what is the actual risk of this finding on this x-ray 
causing a future related orthopedic problem to this specific individual. And we can almost never specifically answer that question, unfortunately. So just to run through, I'm not sure what the demographic is of the, of the audience today, but just a brief outline of thoroughbred sales in the UK. Um, so we have yearling public auction sales, so they're unraced one-year-old yearling horses. Then breeze up sales, which are the ready to race two-year-olds, horses in training. Um, so these are older horses who may already have raced. There are private sales, so individual, individual deals which occur, occur year round, and obviously mares and foals who don't undergo any orthopaedic screening. But again, just to emphasize, it's the yearling public auction sales that we'll be um, talking about today. So the pre-purchase procedure in um, yearlings, radiography is obviously just a small part of a much wider pre-purchase examination. Um, starting with preliminary discussions with the purchaser and the vendor, the physical exam, lameness examination in yearlings, that's only at the walk, so watch the horse walk away and back in hand, the wind test and other ancillary tests, so radiography falls into that group, and ultrasonography um, becoming increasingly used, particularly in premier yearling sales, when indicated. So from the, from the perspective of um, the major um, sales company in the UK, Tattersalls in Newmarket, the use of the repository is voluntary, but is, there's almost 100% uptake, certainly for the premier sales, and that's increasing even for the lower grade sales. Um, the radiographs have to be submitted in a digital format only uh, within 24 to 48 hours, depending on the sale, before the day on which that lot is due to be sold. The images must be dated within 28 days of sales for yearlings and 14 days for horses in training, and the vendor can't remove or withdraw any of the material submitted until after the sale without the consent of the sales company. And importantly, only vets registered to that specific sales company can view the submissions. There are no possibility for potential purchasers to view the submissions. So sales radiography in this, in this case, and in most cases, it's a survey of common radiographic lesions at the predilection sites. It certainly isn't a, a warranty for future soundness. It doesn't function as in, in, that, in that way, because uh, not least because many important thoroughbred conditions are either radiographically silent or they're not routinely included. The views necessary to detect them aren't routinely included in, uh, in sales radiography. There are a number of minimum specified views, and that will vary a little bit with the age of the horse, so yearling versus horses in training. It also varies between particular sales companies, and the individual purchaser may also request additional views. And it's important when you're reading those images to make sure that you're aware of those specific um, uh, specifications for that horse. Uh, this is outside the scope of the of the webinar, um, but just to note that the, there are standard protocols um, for pre-purchase radiography in, in thoroughbreds, and they do differ a little bit between yearlings and horses in training. You can see where the, where the red N there, these are views that aren't included in, in those, either the yearling or the horse in training. And the variation really reflects the relative importance of certain conditions at various stages in training. Um, so in the horses in training, you're more likely will be looking for areas where there will be repetitive damage from cyclic loading of the joint, whereas that isn't necessarily the case for the yearling. Assessing the radiographs, um, of course, they're assessed methodically and not just for, for, for pathology, but with attention paid to the diagnostic quality, the completeness of the series, the date of acquisition, accurate labeling, and any deficiencies noted. And if positioning exposure or superimposition of anatomical structures limit full assessment, particularly of the important predilection sites, then further images should be obtained. And this is usually possible, even in the context of public auctions when time is limited. If you, if you aren't happy with the set that has been presented, then it's, it's perfectly reasonable to ask for further views. And it's important to get standard views because remember as a radiologist, we're basically trained in pattern recognition. And if the basic view does not present us with um, one that we're familiar with, then that pattern recognition is much reduced and we're much likely to either overinterpret or underinterpret lesions. So grading systems are 
a little bit controversial. They're, they're really specific to individual practices. And so they're sort of of limited use, really. They're not transferable between, not even really between horses, um, and certainly not really between different vets of working different practices. Um, the relevance of sort of certain lesions to future soundness differs between individuals with similar defects. So different horses with the same defect, um, the relevance may be judged differently depending on other uh, factors. And the relative importance of radiolo radiological findings can also differ between stages of the career. So these grading systems aren't really translatable between yearlings and horse in training, for example. But roughly speaking, um, the system which I was first introduced to at Rossdale's was a sort of a grading system of one to four. And that's outlined here where one is no abnormalities and number four is unsuitable for purchase. But that may that won't necessarily relate to a specific lesion. It might relate to a specific horse for a specific client. And the concept of risk that we spoke about earlier is, is much more refined to the particular client and the particular horse. So the risk matrix, just to expand on that a little bit further, is sort of graded uh, one to three, one to three points of which you're interested in. The first is the risk of any lesion that you detect becoming active. The second is the risk to trainability should that lesion become active and the risk for future resale or racing eligibility um, if those things, if those lesions are, occur or if those lesions do become active. So reporting in this context is certainly quite different from the types of reports that I generate on a daily basis, um, uh, which would certainly be much more comprehensive. Um, it's basically all the findings are noted in the con contemporaneous notes. So everything that you detect is recorded down usually by hand. And this is the sort of type of worksheet that, um, that lots of vets use. So this is, you can check all the available views, you can tick them off as you, as you uh, as you see them, and then you can note down any which are non-diagnostic, and then um, note down your findings on the top. So it's obviously, as you can see, it's rather sort of casual, and obviously people are working at speed, so it's quite uh, it's written down quite quickly. And only this, the the it's important to, to note that the information is often highly filtered, so only the very the most important findings are usually reported to the client. And depending on the client, um, most reports are either verbal or via messaging apps. So this is the kind of um, correspondence which you might see. And written reports are only usually requested for horses with for horses which the client has purchased. So you wouldn't necessarily produce a full written report for every horse, but some clients may request them. But often it's only for clients who have purchased that individual horse. Moving on to the types of lesions encountered in yearlings, so there's obviously a wide range of developmental and acquired lesions. Many are clinically silent before training commences, and so, um, so you may actually not detect, of course, any lameness or anything when they're at the yearling stage, but not necessarily, um, that doesn't necessarily mean the lesion isn't relative, but before those horses actually start to be asked any questions, they may be sitting there silently. Um, in the literature, there, there, there are some um, there, there is some information about lesion size and how relevant lesion size is to to, um, to future relevance. But nobody really in clinical practice is sort of getting getting their measurement tools out and looking at the size of these lesions. Um, and it's certainly true that other factors, such as the sort of presence of other joint changes like periarticular changes or inflammation in the clinical examination is certainly more important than the specific sort of millimetric size of some of these lesions. So we'll start running through some of the specific types of pathology. And I've started with the carpus because it is one of the more um, important areas. And the first sort of area that we're interested in is something which is, which is um, called sort of dorsomedial carpal disease. And that means sort of any findings on the dorsomedial aspect and particularly of the middle carpal joint. And Again, you'll see the prevalence here. So I've put the, you'll see these as we go through the slides. I won't I won't read them all out, but it will give you an idea of the prevalence of these findings in horses in radiographic studies uh, um, 
given to the repository on yearling thoroughbred. So in this case, sort of between two and three percent of horses will have some sort of finding on the dorsal medial aspect of the carpus. Degenerative remodeling changes in the third and radial carpal bones are of particular interest. Middle carpal joint fragmentation and bone spurs are also used, often found and, and must be noted, but they are interpreted in the context, I think probably more than any other of the findings of the sort of body type of the horse, how precocious that animal is, the maturity and the training intentions, um, that really is taken into account. And you can have some sort of refinement of the importance of these lesions based on those um, findings. But the reason that they're relatively important is because they, the risk for resale is considered quite high. So for future um, sales, um, future purchases may be impacted by these changes. It's also the case that um, once these sort of carpal degenerative changes are present, they will remain evident and they will, will frequently worsen through training. So again, that's why they are of, of particular salience in the yearling thoroughbred. And we've just got some examples there of different um, different severity of the changes that you might find on the dorsal distal aspect in this instance of the radial carpal bone. Findings of much lesser importance in the carpus are modeling of the antibrachial carpal joint um, and mild articular sort of lipping and spurring in the proximal row of carpal bones in the distal radius. This is unlikely to represent an increased risk of carpal lameness in training um, and is considered of low importance. Bone cysts and small osteochondral fragments associated with the ulnar carpal bone are really rather common, so up to 22% of repository yearlings, and they are of no importance to future athletic soundness, and you can essentially disregard them. But other irregularities in the palmar carpus are encountered more rarely, and the importance is judged really on the individual basis of that type of lesion. So, um, so you may sort of alter your judgment depending specifically on any other findings in the palmar carpus. The radius, so physitis, osteochondromas, and exostoses. Um, radial physitis is relevant only really if it's active, and that's because any conformational defect which um, is caused by that will continue to worsen if the lesion is active at the time of sale. So that's important to, uh, to note. Radial osteochondromas, true osteochondromas are quite rare, much more common than physial exostoses, and the latter are low risk for future lameness. Um, not least because there are good surgical solutions if that lesion should become relevant. Moving on to the tarsus, so dorsoproximal um, MT3 spurs and T3 fragments. So enthesiast remodeling is very common, up to 35% of repository yearlings, and could be considered insignificant irrespective of the appearance, even um, a relatively large um, spur, as is in, indicated in this image here, um, I would consider that um, insignificant, essentially. Dorsal fragmentation of the third tarsal bone is generally that sort of distal articular margin is again relatively common up to over 8% and is not associated with increased risk of unsoundness. So again, um, low risk of, of low importance. Osteoarthritis, so minor OA changes involving the TMT and the DIT, these are considered low risk, but more marked OA, particularly in the distal intertarsal joint, um, certainly has potential to develop problematic lameness and is medium to high risk. Tarsal bone wedging um, is rather common and we can see all a sort of spectrum of disease from these mild forms as shown in this image here, um, where sort of the, wedge, the conformation is sort of slightly wedge shaped, prevalence is rather high and generally can be disregarded. When the third tarsal bone is more noticeably malformed and sort of protruding uh, dorsally, as is, is the case here, this may predispose to slab fractures in training, although the risk isn't quantified, and it certainly warrants reporting, but there's still conflicting data on the influence of the racing career. So, so this looks rather dramatic, but actually um, not necessarily going to be a problem for the majority of horses, um, as opposed to this type of lesion where we've got more severe tarsal bone collapse. Um, this is usually from sort of neonatal issues, perhaps uh, dismaturity and such. These are medium to high risk for developing um, tarsal bone fracture, which could be career threatening 
and reasonably high prevalence of those, 1.4%. OCD, so um, if the horse has had an OCD fragment removed uh, surgically, um, it's reasonably common to see, and it is considered a, a low risk of future trainability, so low to negligible risk if you can see that that fragment's been removed and there are no other problems uh, within the joint. The prevalence of actual fragments in repository yearlings, again, rather common, so up to over 8% in uh, taking into account all sites. Um, in this case, in the image here, the distant intermediate ridge of the tibia, there are several fragments uh, visible. The risk for future soundness is low. Medial malleolar fragments, which is um, what the 10 degree lateral DP is designed to, to detect, which is included in the yearling set, um, can occasionally cause joint effusion, but rarely career interference. And small fragments at other sites, such as the distal talus and the trochlear ridges, are generally considered unimportant. Moving on to the stifle, so stifle uh, subchondral bone cysts, prevalence is reasonably high, so up to nearly 6% of repository yearlings. And as with all cysts, the, the future behaviour of them should be considered unpredictable. So um, even if you're feeling pretty confident, it's always some caution is always necessary because of the inherent uh, unpredictability of cyst-like lesions. But features which are generally associated with higher risk for future lameness include, as is the case here, a broad articular involvement, so a wide cloaca on the cyst, marked sclerosis in the surrounding condyle, or narrowing or remodeling of the joint space. So again, you're looking for changes of more sort of evidence of more global joint pathology than just the cyst itself, um, because these are likely to interrupt the two-year-old season, potentially not really rather career-threatening, but just some interruption to trainability. These depressions or loosenses, uh, shallow depressions, less than three millimeters in the medial femoral condyle are rather, um, rather common actually, um, but only a small proportion of horses um, develop a bone cyst at this location. So again, it can be a little bit unpredictable, but generally considered low risk. Stifle osteochond osteochondrosis desiccans, so the prevalence is, is rather common. Um, but the prevalence of lesions which are greater than four millimetres, which are perhaps considered the more relevant size lesions, are much less. So 0.5% of horses have greater than four millimetre lesions. When they've been surgically removed, as is the case here, um, they remain obvious radiographically forever. Um, but as, assuming that the surgical site is nice and quiescent and that they're not extensive, then the risk of developing associated lameness is considered low to negligible. Horses who present with fragments present um, at public auction sales are also generally considered low risk. More extensive lesions with evidence of joint disease um, or perhaps modelling of the joint are associated with increased risk of developing lameness and interruption to training. There's some evidence in the literature that horses with lesions less than six millimetres who undergo surgery before their two-year-old season have a similar outcome to horses um, with lesions greater um, as to normal horses, but lesions with lesions that are greater than six millimeters, there's some evidence that they are less likely to race. So back down to the foot and pastern, um, bone cysts in the dyslinterphalangeal joint um, may be found in P3 most commonly, but also in P2, as is the case on the, with the image here. They're often detected actually on um, they can be detected on images of the fetlock, which are widely collimated. And sometimes if foot x-rays aren't part of, of the standard protocol for particular sales, you may pick them up on the fetlock um, image and then decide to go further down and, and look at the foot specifically. Um, they're not always radiogra radiographically um, evident. Um, and generally, the DP projection um, is the most useful to detect them less easily sometimes, particularly in the in P3 on the, on the, on the lateral medial view. The risk again um, has not been quantified um, and to some degree again they're cyst-like lesions so that they must be considered um, unpredictable. And the, the risk really can't be categorized just on the appearance of the radiographs or the location of the cyst um, and they are considered sort of medium risk because if and when lameness does occur they can pose a serious threat to the racing career. And in the dyslinterphalangeal joint, they may 
be no sort of very good surgical options to resolve the lameness. Past and joint cysts um, come in a various sort of spectrum of presentations. These small midline lucents are considered a normal variant, so you can disregard these. Um, you see there's rather commonly in, in all ages of horses. These more typical cyst-like lesions, which are sometimes positioned centrally, um, or they may be off to the side on one of the condyles, or sometimes in proximal P2. Um, again, reasonable prevalence um, in such lesions. And again just a sort of question mark over these the larger lesions again with a wider articular communications or in particular if they're signs of osteoarthritis um, these are indicators that the lesion may become more problematic and again important because if they do become problematic then they can pose a serious risk to the racing career a section of these con p1 condolysis um, do show resolution coming up to the cell so they might be picked up early uh, months before the sale on the pre-sale radiographs and then by the time you get to the sale they have this sort of more um, resolving look with much narrower narrower neck and nice and sort of filling in rather than a sclerotic margin around them and these are considered low risk so if they have this appearance then you can be much more positive about them. <coughs> um, past and joint osteoarthritis is, is rare but it's considered um, to represent at least a medium risk because if lameness develops when the animal enters training, then the prognosis for soundness is guarded. So if you do see it at the yearling stage, um, then it's important that that's flagged up quite um, importantly. So moving on to the fetlock, and we're going to start again with cyst-like lesions. Um, these are relatively rare, so less than 1% in front and hinds. They can be in proximal P1 or distal third metacarpal or metatarsal bones. They vary widely in size and appearance, and the risk of developing lameness is generally considered low, particularly in those who are found to be dorsal to the transverse ridge. So those which are in the dorsal aspect of the joint, which many are, um, are treated more leniently than those which are in the palmar or plantar aspects of the joint. Um, basically, because we've seen lots of horses who can tr train and race very successfully with these lesions, but because this is a fetlock joint and because we know of the extreme bone stresses in this joint during training, um, if they are in the palmar aspect, then we do consider them higher risk due to the, basically just due to the lesion location. And because you know that joint's going to accumulate damage as the horse enters training. P1 fissures in the glenoid or just off to the edge of the um, parasagittal groove of P1. You see these occasionally. Um, they're very low risk for future impact on soundness. A very small proportion can progress to more serious lesions with, with more obvious lucencies and a, and a wider zone of reactive sclerosis around them, but they are a very small number of cases. Um, this sort of typical non-midline location distinguishes them from incomplete P1 fractures. Um, and they're not considered, importantly, a risk for future P1 fracture when that horse enters training. So ge generally speaking, they're low risk. Sagittal ridge OCDs, they're common, so the prevalence is um, quite high, um, up to 37% in some studies. Um, they can generally be disregarded as unimportant to future soundness, so um, basically low, considered low risk. But if you do see any associated joint effusion or periarticular remodeling, then more caution is necessary. Necessary. So again, looking for more global changes in the joint to indicate there might be a problem there. These sagittal ridge lucencies are sometimes described as OCD lesions. They're a little bit different. They, they sort of take on pseudocystic properties. And uh, as you can see here, the sort of marked lucency with quite marked surrounding sclerosis. These are considered medium to high risk um, in contrast to the to the to the more usual um, sagittal ridge OCD because they are likely to interrupt training once they become clinically active. P1 fragmentation, so starting with dorsal P1 fragmentation, relatively common in front and hind. Um, and fragments are considered low risk, again, assuming no other fusion or, or degenerative joint changes. You get occasionally these these um, sort of atypical larger fragments, which are in seen in the image here, which are arise from sort of juvenile paddock um, accidents. And the main concern for this lesion is that it may interfere with resale value for certain 
clients. So um, not necessarily a problem for lameness, but they are considered um, a sort of serious blemish in some by some clients. Um, however, the attitude towards these fragments is becoming much more lenient. It, certainly in the past sort of 10 years or so, um, few, far fewer people are, are becoming uh, showing concern about these dorsal fragments. The plantar or palmar fragments are also quite common, more so in the hind limb. Um, regardless of how they appear or where they are located, they're generally clinically silent and there's good statistical evidence to say that they stay that way. And so generally they can be disregarded. And even larger lesions, again, which can um, originate from juvenile injury, generally considered benign and don't interfere with training. Supracondylolysis. Um, prevalence is relatively small. This is a radiological finding. It's not a disease process that we can point to. So the cause is not really yet determined. Many people assume it's the result of previous chronic synovial distension from, or a mass effect from, from synovial distension. But they're usually encountered in horses which are otherwise the joint is completely unremarkable. And many in cases where the vets have looked after these horses since foals and, and early um, in their yearling prep, they don't have a history of any clinical issues. So it's um, a little bit of an X-file in most horses. Um, general consensus is that I don't think they should be given undue emphasis with respect to future trainability, again, unless they are severe or associated with other radiological findings. Sesamoiditis, um, in inverted commas, that's relatively uh, common. Um, so marked sesamoiditis is generally considered um, greater than three irregular vascular channels, which are greater than two millimeters in diameter. Um, and the prevalence of those is between two and just under 4%, so reasonably common. These um, are best considered an indirect marker for previous or perhaps potential pathology in the suspensory ligament or the bone interface, rather than a risk to future soundness per se. Um, and basing um, any sort of assessment on these on the basis of x-rays alone is really ill-advised. Um, you do need the, it's important to assess them clinically and if indicated on the x-rays ultrasonographically. Um, so the radiographs often dictate which horses will get an ultrasound scan. And as I said earlier, that's becoming more and more common. And there's a possible association between um, uh, these sorts of lesions and an interruption to training. So negative indicators for prior or existing sesamoid ligament branch enthesiopsis are these large radiolucences in the left image or some or enthesious new bone formation, as you can see in the image on the right. So again, taking into context the, the changes on the bone alone must be um, must be seen in the context of the health of the branch as well and the risk associated with them um, should come from information from those two things. Sesamoid bone fractures, so these historic fractures are rather common, prevalence of up to 10% in the front limbs and they're typically long-standing, sort of sustained as a foal. The heel bone is usually enlarged, as you can see here, elongated proximally is rather irregular shape. The future training risk is low, assuming there are smooth bone margins and no suspensory branch involvement. Fractures which are more recent um, have a prevalence of up to um, nearly 3% in the hind limbs. If the healing is by bony union or incomplete or still fragments remain, then these may pose a risk for future soundness and some caution is necessary. Apical fragments um, in the hind limb are considered low risk. So there's a difference here between hind and forelimbs. In the forelimbs, they may range from low to high risk, and this depends on other individual factors related to the horse and also the, the appearance of the branch um, and so forth. So a difference there between hind and forelimb risk. If you can see a clear evidence of apical fragments having been removed, these are generally low risk, um, but again, all proximal suspensory branch fractures, and in particular the forelimb, the risk assessment is very difficult um, to be specific before training commences. So you really have to see what happens when these bones are loaded before you know uh, how they're going to behave. So um, coming up to conclusions and the key points. So radiography is obviously an important part of yearling sales by public auction. It's very rare that we can um, that we can sort of be definitive about the future relevance of a lesion just from the radiographs. 
The relevance of a specific lesion often differs between individual horses. So what is risky to one horse may not be deemed uh, risky to another horse, depending on all sorts of factors. Um, the relevance of a specific lesion to one client varies often as well. So some clients are very, very comfortable with certain lesions and others don't want to touch them with someone else's 10 foot barge pole. So um, the likelihood of lesion progression uh, or regression varies widely between individuals. And we don't know the reasons for this, but there are obviously numerous and unquantifiable factors why that might be. So any risk assessment at the time of the pre-purchase exam is at best an approximate guide. Um, of, of, as far as the pathologies are concerned, developmental orthopaedic disease and abnormalities of the sesamoid bones are viewed more cautiously in yearlings when compared to horses in training because the yearlings are untested. And as I said, sometimes we just don't know what's going to happen when those, when those joints are loaded repetitively. Radiologic evidence of active arthritis in high motion joints, so the fetlock and middle carpal joint in particular, um, you can have some refinement of risk based on other factors of the horse um, and they should be interpreted in light of the clinical findings but they can be significant at any age and do warrant discussion. Certain lesions are considered low risk for future soundness or sometimes um, negligible risk um, but they can have because of the way the industry works they can have negative impact on resale value particularly things such as OCD fragments. And so again, they may be relevant to a specific client and do are sort of considered worthy of um, discussion. So um, that just leaves me to thank the racing team at Rossdale's. They've been extremely generous over the years showing their experience um, with, um, with yearlings and horses in training. And in particular to Pete Ramsen for the use of some of his cases in this presentation. And now I'm going to pass you over to Mariana for her presentation on elements of the pre-purchase exam in mature horses. Hello, everybody. Sorry, I could not unmute myself. Uh, so, um, can you all see my screen? Hopefully, um, we are now moving away from the uh, thoroughbred race horses, and we are going to discuss a little bit of the uh, images um, uh, in well, I say warm blood, but actually in general, school horses. And of course, I have only half an hour left, so I will not be able to talk to you about um, everything that is need to know about um, pre purges and disgruble horses, but um, I have focused on um, some uh, particular um, some particular lesion that I find more challenging to uh, interpret to uh, and to spot on rage grass. And I also wanted to show you how this, some of this lesion look on the MRI because that um, gives us more um, idea of what the potential clinical significance of that lesion might be. Um, first of all, uh, as Sarah's already mentioned, it's important to critically evaluate the image that we acquired before we actually start in interpreting the pathology. And of course, when a pathology is found, then we need to interpret this based on the um, um, signalment history and the future requirement for that particular horse. Um, when we talk about image quality, is we need to pay attention to positioning and uh, of the image. So make sure that the foot is packed, for example, perhaps remove the shoes if you can. And remember that the better image you take, the easier they are to interpret and therefore you will um, less likely uh, be missing pathology or even worse, um, over interpreted pathology that is not there. Um, also, Remember that if you do not acquire all the projections uh, for a specific reason, then a uh, region, then perhaps you're going to miss um, uh, important findings. Um, this is the case that you might have looked at when uh, you logged in earlier. Um, this is a horse I was uh, involved with because um, he was sold, and this were the pre purchased radio grass, but I was involved later on. Um, because soon after the horse was sold, uh, it became uh, lame. Um, so I was asked to relook really at this, uh, these images. And I think the first 
important thing to notice in these images is that the um, skyline view um, is uh, to me of non-diagnostic quality. Um, so there is some passage superimposed on the navicular bone and also the angle is wrong. So I don't think I can evaluate that. Um, saying that, looking at all the other views, I think what um, uh, I found was that there is this lucency which is superimposed over the, the navicular bone, the DP view. Um, I can't quite see it in the skyline, in, sorry, in the uh, upright view, but perhaps is in this location. But um, since I can't see any lesion in the P3, my diagnosis for this um, case was uh, an erosion of the flexible to the navicular bone. Uh, and that despite I did not have um, a, a proper skyline. Of course, the diagnosis would have been much easier um, if a skyline, uh, a proper skyline was, was acquired. Um, and I think the take home message for, for, for this case is that um, if you have to look for pathology in unfamiliar views, that is much more difficult. And certainly no one um, think of diagnosis erosion in a, in a DP view, but um, uh, this horse did undergo MRI um, and it did have an erosion um, exactly in that location. And you might think that perhaps if it was spotted at the original pre-purchase, then the horse uh, would have not been sold. Um, still keeping at the um, flex support of the navicular bone, uh, this is actually a lame horse, but I, I, I want to talk to you about this horse because I learned a lot from, from him. Um, he, um, when I look at the radiographs the previous, uh, before uh, the horse underwent MRI, I didn't really think very much about the navicular bone. Um, and then, um, the horse underwent an MRI and there was a huge, a huge erosion of the flexor cortex. And then I asked myself, why could we not see it on radiographs? And then you think, OK, what do we actually miss all the time? Um, and if you compare carefully, this is a normal horse a skyline and this is our um, case. If you compare the shape of the flexor cortex of an avicular bone, the normal horse, the cortex has an even thickness and it follows the um, undulation of the sagittal ridge, while in this case the cortex um, uh, becomes thickened at the level of the sagittal ridge. So actually we should have suspected something um, occurring in this um, uh, location. Um, what we can do in these cases is to acquire an additional view, as it was suggested by, uh, by this paper. And what I did with actually my case, I sent the horse back into uh, the x-ray room and I asked um, uh, the interns to acquire a view with a 30 degree angle. And there we are, we can see our um, our erosion of the flexor cortex clearly. So perhaps when we do have doubts in a pre-purchase context uh, of such uh, important uh, findings, acquisition of an additional view with a shallower angle it, uh, could be a, a useful uh, thing to do. Um, another point of uh, con uh, context, I think, is um, the uh, synovial invagination uh, on the distal border of the navicular bone. And we all know that um, if you have a large invagination and loads of invagination, that is uh, uh, not uh, a good finding in a pre purchase context, or in, and these horses might have navicular bone disease. But I think the, um, the separation between, or the differentiation between um, medium or a small invagination and a medium large invagination is quite subjective. And, and I've put you three cases here, um, and I'm pretty sure we will all interpret them uh, differently based on uh, the future soundness of this particular horse. So clearly the horse on the left has uh, absolutely normal navicular bone with uh, no invagination at all. Uh, but what about the other two? I mean, the other two have small invaginations. Um, this one, uh, the, in this case, they're quite thin as well, while in the other case, the invagination are uh, less tall, but perhaps wider in the dorsal uh, palmar direction. So, so the, the question is what we should do um, with, uh, with these horses. Um, I'm not sure I can give you um, a definite answer about this, but what I did, I tried to find some explanation in the literature to see if um, 
perhaps we can um, be more uh, clear on what the significance of this pathology of this uh, radiographic change is. And this is a very recent paper that looked at the um, association between uh, the synovial invagination, and it looked at the size, the number, and the cross-sectional area, uh, and the presence of pathology of the distal interphalangeal joint and navicular benefaratus. This um, uh, paper was uh, performed on, on high field uh, MRI. Um, so we know that invagination of the disabled and navicular bone are related to invagination of the disinterphalangeal joint. So it was no surprise that they found that in horses with a higher uh, number, uh, there was a linear correlation between the total number of invagination and the uh, higher grade in the disinterphalangeal joint score. They also found an association between the presence the depth and the cross-sectional areas of the invagination and the presence of DOP joint pathology and the vehicular apparatus score. Um, what surprised me when I, I read this paper is that they, um, they correlated the invagination only to uh, the navicular apparatus score. And for navicular apparatus, they included the navicular bone, navicular bursa, deep jaw flexor tendon, collateral median ligament, and this is the polygamous. So it's quite a big uh, range of structures. And looking at loads of MRIs, um, we do find lesions in the collateral median ligament or DDFT, which are completely unrelated to navicular bone. So I would have liked to see. Um, an association between um, these enlarged invagination and navicular bone pathology per se. Um, the, other, um, uh, the other thing that they did not do is um, determine the clinical relevance of this particular finding. So I don't think this paper gave me the, um, the answer. Um, but what I find when I, when I look at the MRI, that many times you, you do have uh, invagination, which you can see radiographically, and, uh, and then on MRI, you just see the invagination, which are very nice and well-defined, and there is no reaction uh, surrounding them. And, and I think that's um, the... Um, Clinical relevance of this finding per se is very difficult to determine in um, even in a lame horse. Um, if we go back to our original case, um, which um, was the um, the case with not very tall invagination but quite wide in the dorsal to palmar direction, this was actually pre-purchase exam. Uh, this was seven years old and was. Uh, to be used for show jumping, general riding, uh, and had no concern on clinical examination, had performed fine uh, up to the point of, of this examination. Um, I wasn't particularly worried about this navicular bone or this invagination, that was the only finding in the foot, uh, but um, so I, I didn't consider that a high, a high risk, but I know that other interpreters might consider this differently. A brief um, discussion about the ossification of the angular cartilages. Um, we know that um, uh, markedly ossified cartilage can represent a problem um, in some horses, especially if they are like in these radiographs, um, thickened uh, and uh, with marked increased opacity. Uh, these um, uh, these cartilages on MRI uh, look sclerotic, and many times you can also see bone edema, uh, which is indicative of uh, bone remodeling uh, and bone trauma. And um, I don't find this a particularly desirable uh, finding um, in the context of a pre-purchase exam. We also know that um, uh, Horses with such um, ossified and sclerotic cartilages have pathology of the ipsilateral um, collateral ligament, and also um, often we see um, pathology of the uh, ipsilateral uh, collateral sesamoidean uh, ligament. But I think what is unclear is um, how ossified the cartilages need to be to be worried about them. And this is a case of actually a lame horse, but I, uh, I, um, I think this is a very interesting case because the horse has been lame for a month and therefore you could have easily um, done a pre-purchase exam two months before and the radiographs would have looked exactly the same. Um, 
So if you look superficially at this VP view, there is a mildly ossified lateral angular cartilage, uh, which superficially doesn't look that bad, but uh, actually there is increased opacity within the cartilage. And if you look closer, you can see increased opacity also at the base of the cartilage uh, into the P3. So this was a lone horse that so he underwent uh, MRI and MRI showed that there was marked sclerosis of the cartilage and the base of the cartilage and a little bit of bone edema, but not that much. And the reason why the horse was now lame was probably this tear in the collateral ligament. Um, all this to say that perhaps we should not uh, discount uh, sclerotic um, angular cartilage, even if they're only mildly um, uh, ossified. Another point of uh, dispute, um, and we now move away from cartilage and navicular bone, is cyst. I mean, Sarah already mentioned about cyst in, in, in the foot, um, and I, we do we see them uh, them occasionally, um, and I think they are quite difficult to interpret in the context of the. Um, uh, pre-purchase exam. This is an eight years old uh, uh, Dutch warblet, uh, which had an unremarkable clinical examination. Uh, I don't know what he was supposed to do by, uh, I think, show jumping, um, low level. Um, I think the first thing to notice is that there is this large um, lucency uh, within the P2, and I know that this in the P2 because I can see a marked uh, indentation of the articular surface of, of the uh, middle phalanx, and I can also see the lucency within the middle phalanx. Um, what's the clinical relevance of this particular finding? Well, the cis radiologic doesn't look that active. There is a nice thin rim of um, and increase opacity surrounding the cyst where there is no associated sclerosis. But um, unfortunately, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is no alteration of the bone surrounding it when you do advanced imaging modality. Um, some horses can perform fine uh, with this uh, finding, uh, but some horses uh, do become severely uh, lame. Um, what makes the story worse for this particular horse is that if we look at the other foot, um, uh, there was uh, uh, ill-defined lucency within the uh, DP3, which in this case was surrounded by uh, by sclerosis, and I think there is a defect of the articular surface. So um, probably having two cysts is worse than having one, more likely to uh, to to become a problem. Um, I have. I looked up if there was some specific um, paper that tell that will tell us uh, how this um, cyst um, progress or might affect horses. And the only papers I could find were um, paper on uh, lame horses. And this is um, a very, very interesting and a very recent paper that looked at the MRI features of horses with cyst. Um, and it also compared um, the findings uh, on MRI of horses with um, uh, with uh, cyst and uh, and without and and also the shape of the DAP joints itself, and um, we always suspected that these cysts were um, were likely developmental in origin, and I think this paper confirms it because they found that in approximately a quarter of the cases with cyst, sorry, a third of the cases with cyst, there was incongruency of the joint, and therefore um, likely that. Um, this cyst is a cause of osteochondrosis or um, dysplasia of the DAP joint. What they also found, which perhaps we should consider in the, in the context of the pre-purchase exam, is that all these horses that were lame because of a cyst had DAP joint osteoarthritis, or almost all of them, uh, and they suspected this was perhaps a, a maladaptive response of the joint second to the cyst. So perhaps if we do have a cyst and osteoarthritis for DAP joint, that is um, a worse um, findings uh, during a pre-purchase exam. Um, uh, what is interesting to, to remember is that what they consider cyst in that paper was not just the large lucency that we saw in the uh, case a few slides ago, but uh, they also considered as cyst slight shallow defect into the P2. And these changes we do see um, occasional radiographs and, uh, and I think are quite uh, um, 
interesting um, to report. Um, this is a case that um, was presented for MRI, but just to show you how those uh, changes look on MRI. So we, um, in the left limb, I think we have a normal appearance of the sagittal groove of the P2, but if we look at the right, we can see a shallow indentation of the P2. And, and I think these changes can be um, easily uh, overlooked if you don't acquire um, a good enough um, dorsal proximal pulmonary distal oblique view. Um, when we look at these on MRI, um, uh, you can see a defect in the articular surface and in the articular cartilage and associated uh, remodeling. And this horse also had uh, mild osteoarthritis of the AP joint, so we consider this the cause of the lame. So perhaps um, we should look carefully at the articular surface of the, of, of the P2 um, for these sort of lesions. Um, a different paper looked at indentation of the um, Articular surface of the P3, um, and these are much rarer uh, lesion to see. I think mainly because they're more difficult to spot in conventional radiographs. Um, they, this finding was um, was seen in uh, about half the horse they had were presented for pre-purchase exam and were sound, and they uh, concluded that the exact clinical relevance of these findings uh, was unknown. Um, what um, a, a paper that looks at thoroughbred, a, a similar lesion in thoroughbred, actually they um, they thought that this lesion was clinically relevant. So I think it's, it's a bit controversial and what we can do is report it and, um, and hope that longitudinal studies can be done uh, to see how these uh, lesions evolve with time and training. Um, we move on from the foot and um, I, will, I have a couple of cases with um, of, on the fet look. This is um, an eight years old uh, Belgian warm blood. And this is a um, used for high level show jumping and it was jumping at meter 40, absolutely fine, uh, apparently. Um, after I have done my interpretation, then actually it turns out that it did have a little bit of toe dragging bilaterally and mine, mine lameness, but um, there was no clinical concern on the way the horse was um, jumping or cantering. Um, I've included the images of the feet just to um, just to show you how, uh, how, what, how would you interpret the foot balance for in a context of pre-purchase exam? I mean, clearly this horse has not been trimmed for quite a long time. And I would, um, I would expect that, especially a high level horse, which is um, sold for a lot of money, perhaps would have been trimmed before those radios were taken, but that was not the case. Um, what I um, did not like uh, of this horse with his, his hind fet looks, and um, here are the DP views of his, um, of his hind fet looks. Um, we can see a very small um, subchondral um, lucency at the level of the sagittal groove bilaterally, and there is surrounding increased uh, sclerosis of the, uh, of the sagittal groove. Um, and this is should be considered like a, a short, um, incomplete fracture. Um, this sort of lesion were described well now about fifteen years ago uh, by C. Dyson first, and uh, were reported um, in warm blood and were considered the result of repetitive subchondral so bone trauma uh, and microfracture. Um, so not um, a desirable um, finding in a high level show jumper. Show jumper. Um, more recently, um, uh, they, um, a different group looked at this sort of lesion in another group of warm blood uh, using MRI, and they also concluded that these lesions are um, short, um, uh, short fracture, which are um, surrounded by areas of sclerosis, which are most likely consistent with a chronic repetitive trauma. Uh, what they found in this group of horses that it was also that the prognosis was this lead for this lesion was relatively poor, and only um, about two, only about one third of the horses uh, returned to their previous um, activity. 
um, they did mention that um, most of their horses also had a degree of osteotritis of the petlock, which may have worsened uh, their, their prognosis for this group of horses. <clears throat> Um, Sarah already talked about um, sesamoid changes in, in, in thoroughbred, uh, and this is um, a similar case in the young uh, warm blood. Uh, this is four and a half year, years old and is intended to use for dressage. Um, he uh, was, um, ha hasn't done very much training at the time of purchase, but there was no clinical concern um, on, on examination, no pain on the patient. Uh, but what there were, it, there were quite large vascular channels on the proximal sesamoid bones, and um, especially on this left lateral sesamoid bone, it was quite wide, um, and uh, also this right medial proximal sesamoid bones. Um, at the time when I look at these images, um, well, the only thing I had in mind is what's, what do we know about thoroughbreds, which these uh, changes um, may be associated with poor poorer uh, performances uh, and uh, the, the horses that the thoroughbred that have sesamoiditis are more likely to develop suspensive ligament branches um, when they start training. But um, uh, we don't know and I could not find any literature that tells us about the non-race horses and I think that is an important point because we don't necessarily know um, uh, how um, uh, the, the training and the stress um, of the suspensive ligament uh, uh, is in, in a warm blood compared to a thoroughbred, and it might be that the prognosis is different, but um, there is um, no, there is no um, objective evidence uh, of this. I think we're running out of time, but I have a, a, a very few um, cases about HOC. Um, no, Sarah already talked about this, so we can, um, we can go quickly. Um, this is a five years old quarter horse mare, which was presented for um, pre purges to be used for Western pleasure and uh, showing. And there is bilaterally a spur on the dorsal proximal aspect of the third metatarsal bone, uh, which extends also on the uh, dorsal lateral side, as most do. Um, when a spur per se on his own is identified, I'm not particularly worried about that. Many, the majority of the horses are, um, it's not necessarily clinical relevant findings, but some horses do have um, osteotritis of the tarsum and the tarsal joint. And perhaps if we do see osteotritis associated with this lesion, we should be more wary about this, this finding. Um, this is the paper that refers to this um, uh, to the spurs, and they uh, looked at where uh, the spur was located, and if it's most likely to be associated with enthesiopathy of the dorsal tarsal ligament or be osteophyte, and uh, they couldn't quite decide which one it was. But what they saw is that uh, about half of the horses um, there was a similar prevalence between lame and non lame horses. So probably not a very relevant, relevant finding. Um, this is similar, but a slightly different case. This is a much younger horse because it's, um, it's not even three years old, so it hasn't done very much at all. And we still have a little spur on the dorsal proximal aspect of the uh, terminotarsal bone. But I think in this case, there is also um, remodeling of the terminotarsal bone with some lucency within um, the cortex and mitochondrial bone, and therefore, I'm slightly more worried that this uh, may be associated with the degree of uh, osteoarthritis and that may um, uh, develop uh, or exacerbate when the uh, horse starts uh, his uh, training, especially because this horse is to be used for high level dressage. And the other, um, the other findings that uh, we already mentioned previously is the large osteochondral fragment, which are actually three osteochondral fragments at the level of the distant and medial region of the tibia. Uh, there is no effusion to be seen, but of course this horse is not trained and, um, and we just don't know at this stage how these fragments will um, impact on, uh, on, on the joints. But, um, So to conclude, um, the acquisition of good quality radiographs is essential and, and that is essential to 
identify potential relevant pathology, but also to avoid misinterpretation or overinterpretation of changes uh, that, uh, that you find. Um, you also need to be brave and sometimes think that if your clinical examination is fine and you're sure of that, then the uh, some of the findings are not necessarily related for lameness. And I think we should not condemn horses just because they have three invaginations along with this award and navicular bone. Um, especially if they have performed fine at, until the time of, of um, our examination. Um, I think sometimes um, advanced imaging perhaps should be considered for specific cases, for specific findings and specific, uh, and specific bias. And I have concluded, so we um, can be open to questions. And if you want to type them into the chat box, then uh, either myself or Sarah will answer. Thank you um, very much, Mariana. there. Um, we've got a question here from Alejandro. Um, which is regarding the sesamoiditis in future performance, do you find differences between front and hind limbs when affected um, at a worrying image? Um, I guess this is for me. Yeah, yeah well, either, but mm -hmm. that's just popped up now, so yes. Um, as I said, it's, it's very difficult to, to interpret this finding per se. And I think what I would probably do if I could is, as Sarah mentioned, do an ultrasound of the branches. And then I think he would give more information on what this might be going on. Uh, um, I think it really depends what the horse is, is, is doing. If you have a horse that's overextended his fet looks when it walks, then perhaps uh, I will be more worried about that finding. Um, and uh, difference between hind limb and front limb. Well, that horse particularly actually had all, all fet looks affected. So sometimes I think um, thinking about what that horse has specifically done uh, at the start of his life to have um, overloaded all the four fet looks is more important than the absolute findings that we see now on, on radiographs. Thank you. Um, we've got another one here from Stefano. Do you give different relevance um, if the collateral ligaments in the... Uh... No, the osseous lesion. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, <laughs> oh, you can read them, that's fine. In the corpus or passing joint, um, is my midline or towards the lateral medial aspect of the articular, cart uh, of the articular surface? Um, I think DOP, uh, POP joints, I think many of the cysts are not necessarily exciting. Um, DOP joint, I think the, the, the ones that are in the centre are much more likely to be developmental. Even so, in the paper that I mentioned on the MRI, there were some that were considered developmental and they were not in the centre. But I, I, I do find that the cysts that are not in the centre, they're usually associated with more um, remodeling on, on, on MRI, but of course these are lame, lame horses. Um, I think the answer is yes, I do, for the DOP joint, for the POP joint, not particularly. Okay, thank you. What, well, yes, that's right. <laughs> what, what you want to assess, the radiographic quality. Right, for the radiographic quality of the navicular bone, I think the best way to understand that you have a good view is to, uh, I should have a picture. Um, when you see the, um, uh, have a good view of the articular surface between the, the navicular bone and the P3, that means that you have a good view. And usually you can see the terminal arch within the P3 and that highlights the fact that you have a perfect view through the navicular bone. If your navicular bone looks squashed or it looks elongated uh, in, uh, in the dorsal palmar direction, that means that your view is not good and therefore you should retake it. Thank you. And then, yeah, just the last one. No, that should be Sarah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so is there a difference if risk in risk assessment of DIP osteochondral cyst-like lesions if the cyst is sitting in P3 or distal P2? Um, my personal uh, opinion is that um, P3 cysts, I've seen more of those become clinical, clinically relevant over time more rapidly than P2 cysts. So say we had an identical cyst 
Um, and what and it was in P2 in one horse and P3 in the other midline, the um, you know, the neck of the cyst were the same size, everything else. I'd still prefer that cyst to be in P2 rather than P3. Um, that's just my personal experience. I don't know what Mariana thinks, but um I seem to find more incidental P2 cysts than I do P3 cysts. Yeah, I would agree. The other thing I would say that when the cysts are off midline, so I think we see the developmental cysts very often in the sagittal groove of P2 and the sagittal ridge of P3. And the cysts that I see um, sort of off, off midlines so in the glenoids of P3 or condyles of P2, um, certainly in the glenoids of P3, are more often related to sort of a, a subchondral bone collapse, maybe also um, in younger horses, but um, they seem to be to be traumatic type cysts rather than developmental type cysts. So anything off midline for me is more concerning than a midline cyst. That's definitely for you. <laughs> I think I'm gonna... Is yes, the next, um, next, yeah, next question um, is the navicular invagination large size and number if it's in a yearling? Uh, would it be more worrying about the future um, career than seeing it in a sound adult? So, if it's large, so are we so talking warm blood or sorry about that? To yeah, answer. I mean, we don't really, I can't really assess them yeah. on, on the shots that we take of a yearling. Thoroughbred. Um, so I think that if you're talking about yearlings, we must be talking about yearling sport horses, I guess, which is more your bag, Maria. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I, I think I think considering the age, it's, it's very important. I think yes, I will probably be more worried, but still depending on the size, because I think when we when you X-ray a ten year old and you find you know five six small mm -hmm. imagination, I mean it doesn't really matter, but we don't really know what is going to happen to that navicular bone or you know, if the horse hasn't done anything yet, and you know, we don't know how the horse is going to cope with that particular uh, thing. Uh, so yes, I will be a bit more worried, but I don't think it's something that we do see very often. Hmm. Okay, and then probably just may, this might just have to be the last question, just in the interest of time, and um, from Anna, at what stage? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, can I do the last one? I'd prefer that. <laughs> Regarding incomplete second bone fissure proxy P1, how you can differentiate them from the enlarged blood vessel? I think that is a very good question. And I think sometimes you can't, but I think what I look for is thickening of the secondary bone, because if there is a real fissure, and maybe Sarah wants to add something, I would expect to have remodeling around it. While if you, um, because we're talking about chronic, um, um, mismatch between uh, you know bone lysis and bone and bone production what if you have just a vessel you will only see a vessel but not thickened uh, yeah i think i i agree with that i think another obvious thing is that the subchondral bone fissures are articular so they will breach the articular surface whereas the vessels and they will occur together so if you've got a nice active fissure sitting in the passage in the sagittal groove of p1 you very often got very prominent vascular channels coming from the palmar or plantar proximal aspect of the proximal phalanx so you'll often see the vessels running forward towards the sort of active fissure sort of that area but the vessels will always be below the articular surface the fissures will cause a defect in the articular surface so you can see where they where they track you know where they sort of um morph from one to the other if you see what i mean Um, and then let's just finish with Anna's question, seeing as we uh, did make a start uh, on announcing it. At what stage, if any, would widened vascular mm -hmm. channels in the navicular bone be a problem in sound horses in the older animal? I don't know. <laughs> that is my honest answer. Um, I think it's... I think it's a bit... Uh, uh, I think we can't disconnect the navicular, this invagination from everything else. And I think, you know, thinking about the invagination by themselves is, it's a bit difficult. I normally look at the shape and the proximal distal extension, but I quite like to look at the sclerosis as well. And I think that's, I will translate that to the 
probably more reaction visible on MRI, and we know that um, X-ray underestimate the changes. So if I see a little bit of sclerosis on X-ray, I will expect it to be much worse on MRI, but I don't have a specific black and white method to distinguish to distinguish that. I don't know if Sarah has some word of wisdom to add. No, not really. Just to say that again, as with with those, I um, assume we're sort of talking about synovial vaginations. Look at the navicular bone as a whole. Look at if there's any elongation of the flexor border distally, any proximal border remodeling. As Mariana said, sclerosis surrounding them, any lytic changes if they extend up the horizontal sloping borders as well as the distal border. So it's um, kind of look at those and then start looking globally at the navicular bone and see if everything else is clean as a whistle I wouldn't get too excited in an older sound horse but any other signs that you've got more sinister pathology that uh, might need an MRI to see then be more cautious. Perfect thanks very much um, well thank you all for attending I hope you've enjoyed it and found it um, useful and we hope to see you all at the next webinar um, on the 1st of March please sign up um, using the QR code on the slide here and we hope to see you again. Um, have a good rest of your day. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks guys. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.